Good evening. Good evening. We're ready to uh, start with tonight's hearing. If my colleagues could please come up to the to the table, so we begin. Uh, let me start by saying good evening to my colleagues and audience audience members. My name is Ed Reisinger, and I am the chairman of the Land Use and Transportation Committee for the Baltimore City Council. We're here this evening to conduct the six of eight public hearings in the community on City Council Bill 12-0152, which has transformed Baltimore zoning. Today's hearing will address Title IX, which is Row House and Multifamily Residential Districts. This comprehensive zoning code rewrite is a very important time to learn about the general's public land use and zoning priorities. We want to hear from as many as of our constituents as possible. We would like to thank the administrative team of, and the entire Christo Ray family for hosting us this evening. Uh, special thanks to Mary Beth Lennon and Mary Ann Zoyke. Our host has graciously allowed us to use the facility to conduct today's hearing. However, we must vacate the facilities by 9 p.m. Every, every hearing is open to public testimony and citizens may come and provide testimony at each public hearing. The following guidelines, however, will be enforced today and throughout this process. Persons wishing to offer all testimony must sign in and state their name, their address, or community in which they reside and who they represent for the record. Individuals offering testimony will be limited to a single three minute presentation. The screen behind me will assist you with keeping track of your time. If multiple people from an organization or affiliated group are present, one representative should be designated to speak on behalf of that organization or group. Individuals may not sign in to testify and then yield their time to another presenter. As stated previously, all individuals will be permitted to testify only once. If the, if the individual has points they wish to raise that cannot be addressed in the allotted three-minute time period, they can submit written testimony to committee staff at the hearing. If you would like to attend a hearing to testify about a part of the zoning code ordinance other than the sections the committee intends to study during this hearing, you may do so and your testimony will be taken during the hearing. If you wish to provide written testimony, please merit to the Office of Council Matic Services, attention to Antoine Banks, to my right, at 100 North Holiday Street, Baltimore, Maryland, 21202, or you can email Antoine at antoine.banks at baltimorecity.gov. And if you have any questions for Antoine or information, he'll be here at the end of the hearing to help you out. Um, uh, we have some ground rules. My ground rule is to please turn off uh, or put on vibrate your uh, cell phones, iPhones, um, to give courtesy and respect to those who are going to testify. The uh, planning department will provide us with the report, which includes a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, no questions during the presentation. Wait till after the presentations to my colleagues. Immediately after the presentation, all council members in attendance can ask two questions. Um, immediately after questions from the council members, we would like to hear from our constituents and everyone that signed up to testify will be given a total of three minutes. Uh, before I start, I just want to say we are joined to my left, uh, the council president, Bernard Jack Young. Uh, to my immediate left is our Councilman Jim Kraft, the Vice Chair of the Committee, and this is also uh, Councilman Kraft's district, and he came into my office and said, look, you've got to have a hearing in my district. So, you know, it's, that's why we're here tonight um, at Christo. Huh? I said the best district in the whole city. Well, we can take a vote on that, right? <laughs> We also join to my far right is Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark. To her immediate left is Councilwoman Ricky Spector, the Dean of the Council. Uh, we also join by um, Angela, Gibson, Angela, Angela Gibson, who is here representing Mayor Stephanie Rollins Blake. Uh, from President Jack Young's office is uh, Michelle Horsberger. 
Kara Kunst and Aaron Rowe. Um, so I don't think I hope I didn't miss anybody. Uh, if I did, I apologize. Regina, voice. Okay, and we also have uh, Kevin Parson from Councilman uh, Warren Branch's office. Um, so at this time, uh, okay, thank you, Mr. President. Also entering is uh, Councilman Pete Welsh is entering the auditorium. Um, planning. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. Um, and before I begin the presentation, I just want to note for the audience that we do have maps out in the corridor there, and there's a couple planners that can help anybody who has questions about the maps. And we can also um, do that at the end. <coughs> The zoning code are the rules and regulations placed on parcels of land that determine what can be used and what type of structure can be built. Um, the purpose is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of our citizens, and it's the authority that was given to us by the state of Maryland to establish the zoning code. The first code was 1923, and the most recent was 1971. Um, the zoning code, as I mentioned, is local government law. It determines the type of structure and the uses that can go within the structure, the size, and that sort of thing. It does not distinguish between a good business and a bad business. It does not determine human behavior. The zoning code was last comprehensively written in 1971. We were a very different city at that time, um, very auto-oriented, very much about separation of uses, and very much more a heavier manufacturing city. Um, and we are now very much changed in that, in, especially in the areas of the types of manufacturing, the smokestacks, so to speak. Uh, the new code was authorized under the comprehensive plan adopted by this council in 2006, Live, Earn, Play, Learn. And that gave the uh, four major goals for the new code to support and enhance development to guide, support enhance and guide development, protect neighborhood character, strengthen retail districts, and promote job growth. Also to make the code predictable, understandable, and enforceable. Um, the following principles were used throughout this process. It has been about a four-year process. And tonight, um, the code consists of 19 chapters. Tonight, we're talking about Title IX, row house and multifamily districts. And again, a little bit more detail on the purpose. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, land, state land use articles give the city the authority to develop a zoning code. Uh, that's formerly known as Article 66B, now called the land use articles. This code actually adds um, other purposes to that, enhances that to um, speak to the healthy growth of the city, the job growth, protecting the environment, the employment base, and those sorts of things. The district regulations, of which Title IX is one, are all organized in a similar pattern, Titles 9 through 12. And each one has a description, a table, and bulk and yard requirements, design standards, and then the appropriate cross-references. Uh, the, the use standards are in Title 14. They tell them more of the details, and we'll get into that at a different hearing. Okay, so Title IX is the row house and multifamily district. It goes from R5 through R10 uh, progressively in terms of the size of lot required for a dwelling unit. So R5 is more the garden style row houses or small apartments, and R10 is your high rise residential. And it pretty much goes up sequentially from there. Most of the row houses are R8 throughout the city some being R6 and 7. Some of the common principles, and we'll go into detail some of these things throughout this title, is the neighborhood commercial establishment, and I'll explain that, design standards for both the row houses as well as multifamily, some increase in density if a building is for elderly, standards for building conversion, uh, and we have eliminated the 16-foot minimum dwelling unit for row houses 
and restriction on the number of row houses in a row. Um, after uh, much hearings on that and in testimony, uh, many property owners have been extremely inconvenienced by the 16-foot minimum when their existing houses are 12 and 14, and it, it has caused a disinvestment in some areas. Um, we have eliminated the floor area ratio except in R9 and R10, um, and I'll go into that. We have strict height limits instead, and um, well, this is going to be awful hard for the audience to read, um, but... Uh, we can make it available and it's on our website. But there is a use table for the residential and it indicates whether the uses are permitted. They're, they're in subcategories, residential, institutional, commercial, open space, and other, and whether they're permitted or conditional. And in each category, the far right always explains the use standards and refers the reader to that section where they are. Um, I'll note that the neighborhood commercial is a um, conditional use, and we'll explain that further. Uh, following the use table are the bulk tables, and that is the rules in terms of the heights and then also the lots that are required in each zone. Uh, this is over three pages, but it um, basically the first row minimum lot area is the minimum amount of land you have to have for every dwelling unit you put on that land. So the larger the lot area, the fewer the houses you fit on the site is basically the way that works. The second row there is the maximum building height. And um, it may be important to the council to note we did not change the existing height for residential, it's 35 feet, and that has, has been the same. We did recommend a clear height limit for multifamily. That does not exist today. As you know, multifamily in the residential zones, that is an apartment building, they're governed by floor area ratio. That is a very unpredictable formula for giving heights because if a property owner purchases a whole block of the city and has a floor area ratio of two, um, which is what they have today in most of the row house areas, they can build 10, 15, 20 story apartment building without any variances because they have the whole block to use. And what we are, have recommended as again through a public process is that there be a clear height limit. It's 45 feet for multifamily. Boom, done. All residential, 45 feet. Conditional use up to 60 feet if you're on a corner lot. To recognize that sometimes the corner lots are a little bit bigger, and the, if a corner building's a little taller, it's not really breaking up the block. So, 45, so 35 for the regular house, 45 for multifamily, 60 if it's for a corner lot. And that is the basic formula for in the R zones, um, and that's again on that table. Uh, we have limits on impervious surface, you know, again for the greening, you can't make the whole thing concrete, that sort of thing, uh, there's standards there for that, and the yard requirements. In developing the yard requirements, they're very similar to what we have in today's code, but we did do a little bit of a reality check as to what's on the ground in Baltimore City. So where we found, uh, for example, in one of the zones, the yard requirement today is 25 feet in R8, but over 80% of the existing R8 structures have yards significantly less than that. So again, that puts the property owner in the position of non-conforming. So we adjusted those numbers slightly to, to pretty much map what is on the ground today. Um, neighborhood commercial, this has been a point of much discussion and I would like to explain this carefully to the council and I've included some pictures. In reviewing and planning for this zoning code, we have, we heard from a lot of people, a lot of property owners, a lot of neighbors, that there are some interesting older buildings in their neighborhood, in their residential neighborhood. Example here, um, the, the top one's an abandoned church, the 
um, lower one is an abandoned storefront, but it's in a residential block. It just happens to be. It's 306 Highland. Councilman Kraft knows it well. Um, it, it's empty. It's a storefront, but the entire block is residential. It's residentially zoned. And um, we work to try to establish a means to reuse these buildings, to reuse them appropriately, but to um, have a method to get something other than residential in some cases because a lot of them just don't lend themselves to residential. We've had a number of churches that have asked to have small offices, law offices, there's one in Hamden, a computer office in an old church, that sort of thing. So the neighborhood commercial is a conditional use, nothing's permitted as of right, and it is limited to structures, it is limited to existing buildings, you can't go put it on a vacant lot, and if the structure is non-residential in its construction and original use. The church, the storefront are examples. Um, the next slide shows you some additional examples. Another storefront, another former church. Um, and this is the list of the uses uh, that would be that the board could establish for there. They're not allowed to have outdoor storage, must be pedestrian oriented, no, no drive through, that sort of thing. Um, so these are the areas um, uh, that we have, that the neighborhood commercial would be a conditional use in all of these residential zones. Also, it is important to remember that the, um, this council established a revocation of conditional use a number of years ago. We carry that over, so that, of course, would be applicable for these as well as any other conditional uses. So anything that's established by conditional use that has a problem, there's a pretty straightforward procedure to revoke that use. <clears throat> Conversions, another topic of uh, question and concern, that is when you take a single family house and convert it to multifamily, two apartments, whatever it is. Um, currently, the only rule on that is the area of the lot. There's nothing in our current code that speaks to the size of the building. And in our research, and hence our recommendation, the size of the building matters. You know, whether it should be allowed to be converted to a couple of units or not. And we studied the row houses throughout Baltimore and came up with the number of 1,500 square feet. That does not include the basement. So in order to be able to convert your building, you have to have 1,500 square feet, not including the basement, to even do one second unit. Um, just for example, the pictures up on the right, um, on the slide, the, the bottom picture is Bayview, that area behind the hospital. Those are kind of very typical residential. They are below that 1500. So neighborhoods like Bayview, it's just simple. No, you can't convert under this rule. Uh, no, we measured those houses. We went out to Bayview. When you don't include the basement, they're not 1500 square feet. Yes, that's why, that's, Councilman. The, do the, it, no, I'm sorry. Let's not get into debate. Go okay. presentation and we, okay. can, we can... The, the reason I bring up the example of Bayview is because this is a community that has been subject to conversions already and would be an example of one that would be absolutely ineligible for new conversions. Um, on the other hand, there are many residential areas, such as the one on the top picture, where the houses are extremely large. They're very difficult to maintain, often as single family. They may be on busy streets. This is an example on North Avenue. And those would be over the 1,500, therefore eligible for conversion. So this is new, and this is tying conversion to building size. In addition to all the other factors, the lot size, the parking, we eliminated, recommended eliminating the 75% variance that the zoning board can do now and simply saying, you, if you do another unit, you have to have a parking space. Clear, no exceptions on that. So if you, if you don't have a parking space there, there's no parking at all, you can't do another unit because... Let her finish her presentation, and, please. Um, so the, again, clear, stronger standards for conversion are in this code. In addition, the lot area, the parking, and the building area. 
So the building area is the new factor. Also new to this code are the design standards, and I put in some of these illustrations um, because we found that it's very important to explain these things. For example, whether you have to set the deck back, one of the illustrations, how far do you have to set the roof deck back, or how far do you have to set the addition back um, if the goal on the narrow streets and that sort of thing, and how new construction has to fit into the block. Oops. Um, and with that, okay. that's Title IX. Thank you. Um, you have some questions from my colleagues, Councilman Kraft, then Councilwoman Spector. Okay. Laurie, I didn't want to start with Bayview, but, but I will, <laughs> since you brought it up there. Um, you know, we have a problem with Bayview, and it's really great that you brought Bayview out, because it ties to the discussion that we had um, a couple of weeks ago, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago, at Tawanda, about enforcement. Because we have sent over to zoning enforcement, to housing, to code enforcement, everyone else, um, a number of different houses in Bayview that have been illegally subdivided. People have been cited, noticed, Everyone knows, they know, that they illegally turned single-family homes into multi-family units. And some of them have been like that for a year, year and a half, and no one has made them reconvert them back into single-family units. Our it, role today is to write the best possible set of rules, and then we have to work on enforcement. Well, that, and that's the problem. But, is but the goal is to make the rules clearer because I think today's rules are not, there's the rules, a lot of exceptions. The, ru the rules in this instance are very clear on these, these, in these houses. They've been made very clear. The findings are very clear. And this is what we were talking about the other day. We already have, when you say you can write the rules and they can be enforced, we already have rules that are on the books. We have code enforcement. They're not being enforced. So, you know, you want to take and put us in the liquor board business when we can't afford the existing code in my district. Okay. I just... We'll share I, that with the housing enforcement. They're not... Yeah, they're right. very aware of it. Okay. Um, my, my next thing is, and, and I know my colleague from the 14th district will follow up on this. Why are you putting R7s and R8s back into permitted uses for single fam I mean for conversions from single family to multi families. We work very hard to amend the law so that that could not be done as of right. That it was a conditional use and that we could not people could just not take their single family houses and convert them into multi family units. I mean Neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood in this city was devastated because of that happening. Um, right now, anybody that came here today that drove can see that you can't park around here. If you start converting these single family homes to, to multiple family homes, just the parking issue by that in and of itself causes a problem. To do it as a matter of right is is just absurd. Um, why are you doing it? Um, I, to be honest, we didn't expect that the council would necessarily confer with this recommendation, um, but we talked to a lot of property owners, a lot of organizations around the city, and it's not a one-size-fits-all. We've had uh, many property owners come to us in, you know, in West Baltimore. They have these large, older homes. I can't remember if it was Councilman Walsh. I think it was actually Councilman Mosby's district. There's some large, older homes that it was a very onerous process that that property owner had to go through to do, 
you know, take these vacant house on North Avenue and just put two units in it. It was very expensive and time consuming. And it was very clear, it was a very large building. It was the width for the two parking spaces. And from that experience, it was our recommendation to tie it to the built environment. So that recognizing that there's places that are extremely dense around here, no parking, small houses, easy, no conversion. There's no variance, there's no ordinance, there's nothing. It's just no the way we've written it. When you have the large house, the large lot, the parking, then you can do it. In other words, that rather than have a, a subjective process, we thought it was clearer to the property owners and to the communities, rather than saying conditional, to just say no when the houses are small. Well, you want to use an example of that here. We have big houses in Upper Fells Point and Butchers Hill on the east-west streets and some of the north-south streets. But on the alley streets, we have exceptionally small houses. Correct. But if we allow the big houses to subdivide the R8s as a matter of right, then the problem that we already have because we're already dense because of the small houses gets multiplied if you start taking the big, the bigger houses and allowing them to convert into three, four, five. It wouldn't be allowed because the houses are typically 20 feet wide. That's only two parking spaces. That's the maximum you'd ever get. Um, before Councilwoman Inspector, I just want to acknowledge that uh, Councilman Bill Henry is here, you, and Chair. also we have uh, Nick Blendy, who's here representing Mayor Stephanie Rollins Blake, Councilwoman Specter, and then after Councilwoman Inspector is Councilwoman Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Lori, uh, where the conversions for the row house um, is listed in the Title IX, and it's required that they ha each unit have a parking space. Correct. Does it have to be? abutting the property or can it be somewhere remote that was no, it has to of, be on the property it, that that is definite it has to be on the property yes the other uh question i had and i don't know whether it was something that we didn't deal with in transform but it certainly it does take us in the 21st century is how do we deal with the housing when we're talking about tod's transit-oriented districts? In the transit-oriented districts, they're primar that primarily is not mapped if it's a row right. house area. So they're, they're kind of apples and oranges. There are a few places where we have row houses within the quarter-mile walk of a metro oh, and that sort of thing. We typically did not zone those TOD because we didn't want to create you know, an incentive for people to tear down those houses unnecessarily and, and build something larger. Well, I wasn't thinking but in that terms was a of tearing it down. I was thinking in terms of trying to minimize the damage to the existing quality of the residential uh, properties. The uh, president had the AIA uh, meet with the council for lunch this week. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, active architects that deals with the red line or the or the, the TODs uh, recommended that we put a work group together, and I asked him to send me an email about that, and which he did today. So, so I think we need to bring that as part of Transform Baltimore. Whether we yeah, do we it did at, met, we met with the AIA regularly throughout the draft. They said that they said that, but I guess we should reserve that for the work sessions, Mr. Chair, because that certainly is 21st century issues and so um i, I i'm going but to typically they don't, they're not really overlapping with the row houses so well it depends on where that tod is in in my district um one is going to be at powders at the city county line where the Correct. new social security building is right the tod the... zone doesn't cover that patterson avenue row no. house area we just took it right up to it but not including right. the row houses right okay so we'll put that on the front burner when we're doing the work sessions. Great. Okay.
Um, good evening. Hi. Uh, let, let me begin with the conversion issue and simply say that basically we already rezoned all of the Coldstream Homestead Montebello community with your assistance so we could stop the conversions in that neighborhood. That neighborhood is almost uniformly now R6 Correct. and has remained so in the proposal because, because you said that's what you were proposing. That neighborhood is my largest. It's got about 9,000 people living in it, 3,700 um, housing units. And they range from very small, crowded uh, row house blocks to majestic um, townhouses along the main corridors like 33rd Street, etc. Correct. So they run the range, but they're all R6 because what was happening there was that speculators were coming in and converting um, single family homes into multifamilies. Even on the big houses, it creates a problem. It creates a density problem, it creates a parking problem, it creates problems in those neighborhoods that I feel of my obligation to stop. And so I'm proposing, and you, you already have a copy, I'm proposing that if that's how it's gonna be, that I need to ask my- It's not eligible for conversion. So. I know. Okay. I want seven and eight in the category that's not eligible um, for conversion, so that otherwise I'm gonna have to go in and reduce all the zone, all the houses in my district to R6 and no more than that. And I know that it doesn't matter the size of the house because I look at Chum and that's all R6 and that runs the range of all kinds of sizes. Right. So I know that it can be done and it, that seems like a radical thing to do, but unless we can change and, and make um, seven and eight non-converting as well. Do you second, is that a second to my? Okay, well that's right there. So that is an amendment I'm presenting this evening. Okay. Um, the second thing that I would like to mention is, which really, honestly, I, I'm a dramatic, I, I'm not trying to be dramatic. I think neighborhood commercial establishments are so far along with the RMU and the DMU, the scariest things I've come across in this code. By the way, there's lots of good stuff in here, and I'm not sure. You know I'm going to always talk about the amendments because the changes that I would like to see. There's a lot of hard work that's going into this whole thing, but let's, we're, we're talking about things we're concerned about. I am next to panic about neighborhood commercial establishments which apply to R5 through R10 residential properties throughout the city of Baltimore, everywhere. In that case, as I understand it, anybody who owns a house in one of those zones can go down to the zoning board and request a conditional use to create, well, I have a friend in the, I have a constituent and friend in the, in the in the audience who I presume will tell his scenario, so I'm not gonna steal it. But I can open a, a, a commercial establishment on the first floor of my house on Clover Hill Road with a conditional use approval. Your house wouldn't zoning qualify. Board. Your house wouldn't qualify. I'm an R5. It's, it's not a, it, it's purpose built as a house. Only the odd That's buildings with the storefront. That's not what this front. says. It says, no, 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 no. It, does. it is. That's not what it says. It says, I'll find it. I'm well, not going to take up I, your time. I would urge the council to look at the wording and not throw the baby it's, out with the bathwater. If I missed it, well, wait a minute. That's from the code definition. 
The building itself has to be not purpose built for residential in order to qualify. The best example we have is the church in Hamden in, in the 14th district. Um, we just got approached by another church in the 14th district that's very happy about the neighborhood commercial. The neighbors are very happy about it on Roland Avenue. Um, we have a number of odd, right actually near us here in Butchers Hill, there's an oddball warehouse on a block um, that right now is zoned B3, and we're recommending down zoning it to R8 because they now have the neighborhood commercial option to better reuse those existing buildings. Let, let um, me, may I just, in Butchers Hill. just because I only have two questions or comments, and this is my second so one, house. if I may, if I may. If I miss that, when I read it and took notes, then everybody's going to miss it. So I would propose that in the case of these oddball buildings, zone them to be commercial and let the neighborhood approve that. Now, where's an example? I have a bunch of non-conforming liquor licenses, packaged goods stores, in my district. They are zoned residential. I came to planning and said, and you have, were very helpful, and I thank you for that, that I said, what am I going to do with the, in, with the ones that the neighbors want to save that are contributing to the neighborhood? I said, my idea is to just rezone them commercial. And that was something that we agreed was possible and that in a comprehensive rezoning is the very time when you can do things like that, and it's not spot zoning, because there's a purpose, it's comprehensive. I'm saying the same about these oddball properties. Zone them commercial and let them stand the test of public opinion whether we can go through with that. But don't put us all at risk that a, that a phrase that I missed and I and I can't find it fast enough. To it's go the back definition to in Title One. Uh, so rezone them, commercial, uh, and let the residential be non-threatened by the possibilities of having somebody, some screwball down the street, go want to open a restaurant on the first floor. That's Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, that's with, with all due respect, we, we in many cases down zone some of these from commercial to residential at the request of the neighborhoods because the preference was for the neighborhood commercial. It gave the communities more control than a rezoning to commercial. It gave them input. It also encourages the reuse of the building as opposed to the demolition and putting you know a, a, a new uh, commercial structure that may not fit in. Um, you know, I think you'll hear testimony on all sides yeah, of this we, issue. Yeah, we, we understand. I just want to say to my colleagues that, you know, these are basically recommendations that came from the planning department, the planning commission, and that's why, you know, we'll have work sessions and we'll agree to disagree. Um, at this time, Councilman Henry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good, good evening, Ms. Reinberg. I always enjoy the opportunity to come to Cristo Rey, especially the Jim Cafetorium, and, uh, talk about whatever today's issue is. And today's issue appears to be um, rapidly becoming uh, conversions. But I'm going to drift away from that a little bit to a broader topic. And that is um, an observation that both the issue of conversion of single family to multifamily and the issue of the neighborhood commercial establishments Part of the reason why they are as troublesome to us as they are in the Planning Commission's recommendations is because the overall set of recommendations has excluded a previously well-used concept that would have dealt with both of these issues, and that is the idea of making something conditional by ordinance of the City Council. And that is where we could be dealing with both of these issues in a more case-by-case -case fashion that reflected the needs of the neighborhoods. And here's where this is important. I wrote down the quote that you thought it would be better to follow the built environment. 
And here's where it becomes difficult for me to see eye to eye in general with planning. And I think it's ironic that scant, scant blocks from where I spent eight years doing residential and commercial development and first learned to hate individual portions of the zoning code. Um, this is where I want to make it very clear that, for example, a 1,250 square foot row house, two-story row house in Bayview has very different needs and impacts on its surrounding community than a 1,250 square foot two-story row house in Woodburn McCabe, where density would be desired, where people would like the opportunity to have a small one-bedroom apartment because they won't necessarily have a car and it won't necessarily be a huge impact on the neighborhood in terms of parking problems. And when we have a conditional by ordinance uh, capability, then that lets a council person who represents one neighborhood deal with these types of density issues in a way that a blanket zoning code for the city can't when it's trying to just work off of how the building is built. Um, now, for, as, a, as, a, an, as an aside to my colleagues, I, I think if you remember back, it was probably like three years ago when they brought in the consultants who were going to be helping to do the transfer process, and we all got to go over and sit down with the consultants and tell them our suggestions about what we thought comprehensive zoning should include or look like. The, the idea that I gave them that they all really struggled not to laugh at was, I said, can we have 14 different zones and just make each council district its own zone and then we can work out the individual stuff on a district by district time? Because the truth of the matter is, row house neighborhoods in one part of town aren't the same as row house neighborhoods in another part of town that look exactly alike. Detached home neighborhoods in one area have completely different needs and situations than in another part of the city. And I want to say, I want to take this opportunity to say, we really need to restore the concept of conditional by ordinance so that council people can address these issues on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, thank you, Laurie. Uh, this time, the law department. Good evening, Mr. Chair, Elena DePietro from the Baltimore City Law Department. The Law Department had no comments on Title IX. Okay, do you have, a, do you have any amendments to this article? No. Okay, um, any of my colleagues have any questions or comments to the Law Department? No? That was quick, thank you. Uh, DPW? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Marsha Collins, representing Department of Public Works, Department of General Services this evening. Um, I don't have anything specific to this chapter, but would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Does DPW have any amendments to this article? No, sir. No. Okay. Any, any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, transportation. Uh, I see BDCs here. Dave Garza, do you have any, any comments? Okay. Any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? comments to BDC. Okay, so that takes care of all the agency, report, agency reports. Um, is there anyone from an agency that's here that I didn't recognize? Okay, so now we're ready to go to uh, testimony from the public. Anyone, those who came in late, if you want to testify, it's up front with those two gentlemen. Um, Uh, first is uh, Joan Floyd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Joan Floyd, President of Remington Neighborhood Alliance. Uh, from my many years as a, a homeowner and a Civic Association president, I know the change can come as an unpleasant shock when it happens next door or down the block or across the alley. An unpleasant shock can put an end to a homeowner's residency in the neighborhood and in the city. 
it's important that our city council representatives understand this dynamic we live very close together in our rows of homes with an expectation of predictability that is easily destroyed by bad zoning and acts this bill proposes major impacts for our established row house blocks in the form of new conditional uses including increased height and increased non residential use case law tells us that a conditional use is a compatible use and that it's the protesting neighbor who has the burden of proving otherwise we need our city council representatives to be very careful about enacting new conditional uses in row house districts height increases the proposed new R8 district allows a two-story house and a uniform block of two-story houses to grow to three or even four stories. The taller house will automatically be considered compatible with the shorter houses on the block. Why is this supposed to be a good idea? Fraternity houses. The proposed new R7 and R8 districts allow new fraternity residences, party houses, and dining halls in row houses within 1,000 feet of campus. Each will automatically be considered compatible with the other houses on the block. What will this do to neighborhoods like mine? Neighborhood commercial. I've been mentioning neighborhood commercial, as you know, in every, at every opportunity during these hearings. The new neighborhood commercial, which applies in the new R5 and up, and has no, no enforceable minimum lot area and no required parking, is a terrible idea. Who purchases a home in a row house district expecting the house next door to turn into a hair salon or convenience store with no parking? With one exception, this, the list of neighborhood commercial uses on page 227 is the same as the list of RMU uses on page 194. If the RMU overlay causes concern, the neighborhood commercial should cause greater concern. Now, I know Ms. Feinberg made some comments to this point, but it's, she's a planner, and it's not, obviously, we know she's not your independent legal counsel. And so it's not up to Ms. Feinberg to assure you that this only applies to certain types of buildings. And it's not up to Ms. Feinberg to assure you that conditional uses can be un easily revoked. So, you know, as a carryover from this morning's hearing, this is one of those circumstances when you really need that independent legal counsel to help you suss out what's going on here. Um, a question I have, what innovations are necessary and desirable to enhance our existing row house blocks uh, for home ownership, and what innovations are more likely to do harm? Please consider this question. Uh, give a careful examination in this comprehensive, comprehensive rezoning process. And thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. You got a copy for us? Thank you. Stephen, Stephen Go, G Works, G Works. I apologize if I messed that up. Yeah, most people mispronounce huh? it. Most people mispronounce it, so don't feel bad. How do you about pronounce it? The words. The words. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it means spice in Yiddish. Uh, yeah. All I want to say, what I want to say basically, is that I want to. Sh uh, I agree with what uh, Ms. Floyd said. The key thing to me is make sure it's spelled out that neighborhood commercial is only buildings that. Uh, are complete, you know, are, were really built for something out for something commercial, or maybe churches. But I live in a residential block. It's entirely residential. Two stories on my side of the block. Three stories across the street. I don't want to wake up and find that somebody has suddenly opened a French restaurant. Council Member Clark, I think, was think, made a remark. I think, referring to something I wrote where I said, well, I'm going to open a restaurant called Shea Steve with uh, not worry at all about the fact that nobody could park because we have, have enough of a parking problem anyway. And my signature dish was going to be plein de merde, which full of, you can fill up the rest. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> I just... I, you know, I just don't want to, I just want to see my block stay residential. I don't want to see other things. And I'll also agree with Ms. Floyd, I absolutely don't want to see fraternity houses come in. And we, I mean, we live close enough to Hopkins. There was a period some years ago when uh, there were students, uh, just a particularly bad group of students next door to me. We just had the worst roach infestation. It lasted several years until a wonderful person bought the house and moved in and, and everything changed. I don't want to see that problem. So I know you can't control who rents a house, but you certainly can control uh, 
having fraternities and sororities. So I'd like to see that very much restricted also. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And, and just remember, you're welcome in elders who testify in the past and the future that we welcome you to participate in the work sessions when they come out. Thank you. Uh, Ed Hopkins. Hi, um, I'm Ed Hopkins. I live in 2960 Wyman Parkway. Um, I've been studying the proposed zoning code. I was trying to understand what changes were coming to my row house area. And the more I studied, the more upset I get. Neighborhood commercial worried me at first. A whole set of new conditional uses was coming to be allowed. Um, but they see, the definition seemed to restrict them to uh, odd-sized non-row houses. But then I found out, and I can show you where this is in code, Mary Pat, neighbor commercial can go in any row house. The definition says one thing, the specification does not limit it that way. Um, planning confirmed that this is the correct interpretation. Then I thought I shouldn't worry about conditional uses in R6 through R9 uh, because they're restricted to a minimum lot area of 5,000 square feet right now. Um, my lot, most of my house lots are under 2,000. I shouldn't worry about this. But checking the proposed code, I found that the minimum lot area for all conditional uses in R6 through R9, including neighborhood commercial and those restaurants that go with it, is 3,000 square feet. 3,000, getting closer. Okay, I thought that's getting closer, but there's a cap on how much of a variance that a zoning board can grant to a lot size. Lots, minimum lot size can only go 25% lower. Row houses are still safe from becoming restaurants, right? I just checked to make sure that the variance cap was still in place, just to be sure. There is no variance cap in the proposed code. Um, the zoning board can put a restaurant in any size lot in an R6 through 9 or R9 area. Uh, I, the detailed support for these assertions are in the, here. I, I let, give all the code. Um, this is a major change in the zoning of row house districts. All conditional uses including the new neighborhood commercial bundle set of new conditional uses, can go in any R6 through R9 area. As far as I know, no one knows about this. It's hidden in the proposed code. Planning did not cite this as a change when it gave a list of changes that were coming about. Um, as far as I know, planning didn't tell you about it. I don't, I, I think they didn't. Um, if the citizens of Baltimore knew what was buried in the proposed code, they would have protested this a year ago. They would be filling this room now. They're not here. They don't know this is happening. It's empty. Um, how can you even consider moving forward with this proposed code with this kind of stuff in it? Uh, respectfully, I submit, I think two things should be done by this committee. First, I think the whole package should be rejected. Um, there are major changes in here that are hidden. Major changes are hidden. They, um, no one knows about them. Kick it back to planning for a complete do-over with a new code that clearly says what it's about so people can understand it so you can have a serious public review. You haven't had a public review. People didn't know about it. Um, if something like this sort of major change that's hidden doesn't move you to do something like this, I can't imagine what will. Secondly, I would investigate how this happened. Why are we here tonight talking about major changes at the last minute when this should have come out a year ago, a year ago. Why did this happen? You want to know why it happened so it doesn't happen again. If I were sitting where you are, I would push to do these things. Thank you. Yeah. Ed, yes. Ed um, Mr. Hopkins, uh, this is why we've had, we're having seven or eight hearings to review the recommendations from the Planning Commission, the Planning Department, right. and uh, we welcome you to participate in the work sessions to bring those issues and concerns you have. Okay? So we are, you know, we're not taking this, nothing, nothing in this rewrite is set in stone. That's why we're having the hearings. That's why we're going to do the work sessions so we can sit down together as a, as a committee and also with the people out there in the audience who, who's, who's invited to the work sessions. And we're all in this together. So it's nothing that that the planning department or the, or the planning commission or any entity, any other agencies, has the mindset that they're pushing this through. It was, they had their hearings, they had their meetings, this is their recommendations, and, it, and we're having hearings, and we're gonna sit down, we're gonna look at it, and we're gonna discuss it, and amend what we have to. Yeah. Councilwoman Inspector, yeah. Mr. Hopkins, I'm, I'm sorry. Where the neighborhood commercial is described, 
if the, the language is a neighborhood commercial establishment means a commercial use that is within a residential neighborhood, but in a structure that is non-residential in its construction and original use. That's the definition. That's not the specification. In, well, in, in the second draft of, but, the but, of the code, in the specification where they talk about the requirements, they had a requirement. This is from the draft two. It's gone now. Um, let's see, it says on the existing structure is clearly non-residential in its original use. That part of the specification is gone. You got a definition? It's not required. Okay, but, so you, you have you have to get experts. But that's that at the work session is where we actually determine the, the, the reason that this for me makes sense, churches, there were so many permitted uses in residential over time. But they were never they weren't built to be residential. I, they, I, I agree with that completely. Right. So I think this is what makes it sense because the, those buildings that were permitted to be in residential, even though they weren't built to be residential, they are obsolete now. Sometimes they have no, uh, they haven't been a church or they haven't been whatever was permitted when it was built. Okay, Council Inspector, I agree with you completely. If right. that were what was so done, how, but the code doesn't restrict, the proposed code does not restrict never commercial to such buildings. They, we'll there was to, a restriction. But we'll have, to, we'll have to make that happen. Well, but you should worry about the fact that the dra second draft had it. We're not going to worry about it. We're going to do it. Okay. That's why the, the dog and pony show comes first and then the work session. <laughs> okay, well, I, want, I think there's a wonderful intention, but it's not in the code, and we want to put it in the code, and a lot of this other stuff, too. Where is me? Well, I, I think we're intent on making sure the interpretation has the right to the so that we, we don't even have time. We're going to do what we have to do. Just well, we welcome you to the work sessions in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hopkins. Um, Douglas Armstrong, yes, law department, you can play hard. Elena DePeter from the law department again. I thought perhaps I could just um, uh, help people to understand a little bit that definitions in the code are part of the law. So you, the definition of neighborhood commercial, which is as Councilwoman Inspector just read, that's the threshold issue before you even get to the, um, the specifications, as, as Mr. Hopkins called them. So first you have to establish that the, that the structure is non-residential in its, in its original use before you can even talk about whether or not it's, it's going to be allowed in the particular district. So I, I hope that helps um, some people yeah. maybe understand a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Armstrong? Good evening, Douglas Armstrong, 2828 North Howard Street, and I'll, I, I came with uh, two issues tonight, but I'll start with the, very fir with, the, with the issue that I've mentioned every time. I think Councilwoman Inspector and the rest of the council is poorly served by not having your own attorney. You do not need the law department. I know, I know you're all waving your hands and all that sort of stuff, but getting ex explanations by the proposer of the bill as to what it means and what it's going to play out and how it's going to play out is a disservice to the citizens and it's a disservice to you. You need your own legal counsel. So let me... Uh, the president wants to respond to that. Okay. I'm sorry I couldn't be there at the, yeah, the hearing. Um, long before you even mentioned about a lawyer, that's one of the first things we said when they first brought the uh, Transform Baltimore to this council. Because I'm no zoning expert. I do know what our eight and all that means, but I'm no zoning expert. So we recognized that from the start, that we needed some legal advice and we're seeking to get that. Okay, I appreciate that. I'm just saying that within the context of this evening that citizens are observing, you're still being given legal advice by the proposer of the bill. And that's, I personally feel as a tax paying citizen, unacceptable. That's pretty strong. We get it. We, we understand. Ah, well, maybe you can convey the, we that fully. Yeah. The two issues I'd like to address tonight uh, are, are first that row houses and the people that live in them are the heart and soul of Baltimore, of this town. They pay property taxes, they pay piggyback taxes, they pay energy taxes, phone taxes, sales taxes, car taxes, you name it. They pay taxes. This simple dollar density 
of row house neighborhoods makes their continued success an absolute must for Baltimore City. Row houses <coughs> ceasing to be a success in this town or in any way threatened to be a strong backbone of this town, Baltimore is in serious trouble. The proposed RMU overlay and the neighborhood commercial conspire to dramatically change many neighborhoods. A sustainable Baltimore does not need neighborhood commercial or the RMU. I urge you to remove those from the code. Remove them. The second point is you have been tasked with attempting to make sense of this code. You were presented with the code as a bill. You've been trying to apply this to the maps, to your own neighborhoods and districts, and most of all, to understand the consequences of which, of what this means to Baltimore and to your neighborhoods. This is not possible under the currently proposed arrangement. You have, in fact, a fatally flawed system, situation. Planning came to you with a voluminous set of revisions to what they originally presented to you as the code. Without those two being put together in some fashion where you can see what is in the bill and what is proposed to be changed from it, you don't have any basis to make good decisions. Unless planning can provide you with a side-by-side -side comparison of what they are proposing now with what they started out proposing to you a year ago, which is the bill, then please just reject all of their amendments or stop the process. Send the bill back and have them add those amendments and then let them come back to you with a version that we can all then sit down and debate and understand and evaluate for our own purposes each neighborhood and each individual property. Thank you. Doug, I think Casper Kraft has a question. Yeah, um, Mr. Armstrong, I can't speak for anyone other than myself. But as far as I'm concerned, the amendments of the planning department are amendments like anybody else's amendments. They've got like 500 amendments, and then there are going to be amendments from the council members, there's going to be amendments from citizens, there are going to be amendments. This is the bill. This is the bill. This is what we have. When we have these, I believe Ms. Kunst is putting together and numbering every single amendment that came in, whether it came from planning, law, who, whoever it came in from. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm starting with amendment number one, looking at that, seeing what it is. But I'm not, um, I'm not taking that as being the, um, the bill or, or whatever. I'm looking at each ind amendment individually. Well, then per I, personally. Okay. Well, I, I however, however you intend to, to go through that, that kind of a process, I think, is going to be extremely laborious and is only going to be fraught with with additional confusion. But however this council dis determines to do that is however they're going to determine it. I'm just trying, as a citizen, as a property owner, to make some recommendations that might make it a little easier. We'll deal with that. Thank you. All right. Okay, uh, I apologize if I messed this name up. It looks like he's in my district. Lives at 1903 Harmon Avenue. Maswar Abdul, help me out with this. Introduce yourself, so I'm Mansour Abdul Malik. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, I'm here to, to really break this up. Personally, I think it's a great idea. Uh, the commercial overlay is good for those areas of North Avenue where they've been decimated. There are almost food deserts. Why can't we bring in people to put in shops, fruit stores? Why can't we have an area that's similar to certain neighborhoods in New York where the shops start to make that neighborhood alive again? There are plenty of people in this room who live in affluent neighborhoods currently and they do not want to see those broken up. What about those people that are not here, they're in non-affluent neighborhoods that need this infusion of not only capital, but also people to have an actual purpose to make that neighborhood better while also making themselves economically better off. Personally, I think they've done a wonderful job. There still needs to be tweaking to it. This is where the work groups come in, but we must look at the entire city, not just the affluent neighborhoods of, of which people are now missing. Okay. Thank you. Now, Councilman Henry, you have a statement. 
Bob, you want to cast the Henry Hazard? Yeah, no, I, I, I want to I tell you, I, I think we're all on the same page in terms of there are definitely places where this needs to be done. It's a question of how do you do it? Do you do it by letting it be done anywhere, or do you do it with a little bit, you know, some, some parameters on it so that, like, for example, you, you, you described North Avenue. Yeah, there are lots of spots on North Avenue where they would benefit from neighborhood commercial. Um, although I would have to admit that I would have to think about what parts of North Avenue aren't zoned commercial and why aren't they to begin with, um, given that you know, given the nature of North Avenue as a as a as a, as a whole. But I but I get that there are parts that might not be zoned commercial. But when you just flatly say, you know, R six R seven districts. Now you're talking about places where we're not talking about arteries. I mean, you're talking about little side streets in little residential neighborhoods where it needs to be clearer. And I understand that the planning is making the case that there are some parameters already in place to prevent commercial just popping up next to Councilman Clark's house. Um, but we want to, I, I, this is why I, I say that if you went to the council person for the area where you want to do this type of commercial development and the council person looks at it with you and says yeah this 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 area needs to be fixed and the community all around there goes yeah yeah this area we would love to have some stores then conditional by ordinance would give you the flexibility to do that as opposed to perhaps a developer and this is what i see a lot in my district where somebody has a good idea for a business and goes and you know rents a place from a landlord and then finds out afterwards that the community association is uncomfortable with their idea. They've already started putting money into it. It just would be easier and better if everybody worked together at the onset. And that's all. That's all we're saying. Sure. Well, yeah. in the uh, taking a look at the documents, there are certain areas that are specifically laid out. They're actually letting you know where this idea would be, what, much of which is in decimated areas. Uh, so they've already done the legwork. If you read the documents, if you pay attention, and if you know the city, then you will surely know that this is specifically for helping to make those bad areas better areas. And I completely agree with you. I, I mean, as a homeowner, as a developer, as a person that, that develops properties in Washington, D.C., I can speak to that. What we do is we go through ANCs. We actually speak to the community yeah. and we find I would love to have so, ANCs here. Well, uh, those are the types of things that we need to have that we do not. So having, having a say-so from the top as well as from those folks that are going to be in that neighborhood, that's what we need. Now, that's going to be more in the working group, but I do not think it should be scrapped at all. Yeah, well, we welcome you to the work session. Yeah, I will be there. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Councilman Clark. Uh, just yeah, wait, you, this, this is being recorded. You need to not, not to engage in a big dialogue, but what, which, what is it that you're saying should not be scrapped? I'm saying that the commercial overlay, the, the, the neighborhood RMU, the commercial, DMUs, the RMU and the DMUs are very good. Oh, ideas. the RMUs and the DMUs. Yes. Whew. And the neighborhood commercial. Yes. Oh, and the neighborhood commercial. Correct. Got it all. All of it. Okay. Yeah. All right. I, I read it. Did you? I sure did. You hope so. Every word. I don't think you did. She, she's not the Oh, yes, I did. Oh, yeah, you don't. Not her. Me or, me or somebody. Yeah, you can mess with us. I really did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Denise Whitman. Hi, my name's Denise Whitman, and I'm the president of Friends of Fountain Street. And I'm going to talk about two specific properties that are currently proposed to be C1 in the midst of a B2 R8 area proposed zoning. Um, when we went to CHAP, we were told that zoning was going to protect us, but I see it just doesn't seem to be the case because now the zoning is changing. Um, the properties are 2030 Alice Ann Street and 2030 Fountain Street. They were formerly B2 properties. Then at the owner's election, they went to R8. And now the owner wants C1. Um, the 2030 Alice Anna and 2030 Fountain. One's a vacant lot and the other's formerly a garage. But like I said, on both of those properties, 
the owner wanted R8 uses, so they went to R8. Um, the 2030 Alisana property is contaminated. The owner refuses to abate the contamination and now will be given a bone, basically, of a 60-foot height limit so he doesn't have to abate the contamination. He'll let a developer do that for the extra heights. But unfortunately, that's on the burden of the residences that are along Fountain Street. Um, or he can cap it and build right up to the 60 foot. Um, this is in the middle of residential block. Uh, 2030 Fountain Street is formerly a garage. It hasn't been used for a garage in 20 plus years. That would also have a 60 foot height limit. It's bounded on both sides on, uh, across Castle Street, the alley, by residential, a two story and a three story residential houses. That would be allowed a 60 foot height limit too. The owner elected to go to R8 from B2 to accommodate a church, which created parking havoc on our street, and now is in violation of the zoning code currently because he houses a business in the, there that's not allowed in the R8 district. Um, every property owner from 2030 to 2050, which is nine properties, are against this, every single one. Um, this needs to either go to what it was, B2, or to what the owner previously elected, which was R8. C1 is way too much. It's way too dense, way too high to be in the middle of a residential street. What I, what I recommend, um, this is in Catholic's Crafts District that after the hearing discussed because some of, if it's a violation then i would if i were you i would sit there and talk to councilman craft after the hearing right i have the information okay if you can give me a written copy i i will this is just scrap yeah. scratch okay. all right thank you denise virgil bart bartram is that bart bottom or bartram 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 Good evening. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Virgil Bartram, uh, 2011 East Pratt Street, uh, Butchers Hill, uh, representing Butchers Hill Land Use Committee. <clears throat> I wanted to bring a concern uh, relative to uh, parking and multifamily uh, dwellings, multifam new multifamily apartment uh, developments uh, that uh, I'm hearing all over uh, Butchers Hill and a uh, number of residents throughout uh, the surrounding area. Uh, and that's uh, uh, parking at, at new uh, uh, developments. We're finding that, uh, first of all, there's only a one uh, parking space per dwelling unit requirement. But, but of course, but beyond that, what we're hearing is that um, we're being told by developers that, well, we're not going to uh, rent those apartment space, those parking spaces with the apartments. Uh, the, the concern, and then we've uh, recently been quoted uh, from a developer developing 500 apartments nearby that they expected an 85% uh, rental rate of those parking spaces. Uh, and as an example, we were told that uh, those, uh, we, were, we asked, okay, then can neighbors in Butchers Hill or surrounding neighborhoods then rent those extra parking spaces that aren't being used? And we were told, no, we're not running to strangers um, because it would be a security problem. Uh, so I'm hearing that all over the neighborhood that, that although uh, that you have this development, and we do like the development, and, uh, but we're still concerned about parking and we're concerned about uh, the use of these parking spaces not going with the units. Uh, this, could of course uh, I, I didn't make it to the PUD meeting. It, it, refer, it would uh, also be a, uh, effective to PUDs and to uh, R8 districts and, and similar high density uh, residential. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, huh? You have testimony. You would have. Uh, I'll mail it in. Okay. I'll email it to Mr. Uh, Councilman Craft. Virgil, I don't know that um, 
anything can be done on the Washington Hill. Um, HUD. Looking to the future. Right. But, um, but we're going to have some, um, some working groups besides this one, and I think Heather has some information about that so we can follow up with you on it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Councilman Kraft. Um, thank you, Virgil. Uh, next one to testify is Graciela Cavicier. Graciela Cavicchia. Um, I currently work for TRF Development Partners, a nonprofit housing development organization that has rehabilitated over 120 vacant properties in the Oliver neighborhood in East Baltimore. When we started working in Oliver in 2007, the neighborhood was 44% vacant. Today, after $25 million in public and private investment, the vacancy has dropped to less than 12%. Most of the buildings that we have rehabilitated have been vacant for decades, including the small corner stores that created livable communities with such uses as, as bakeries, candy stores, and small neighborhood pharmacies. Today, new and existing residents are enjoying the revival of the Oliver neighborhood, happy to see a reduced crime rate, occupy homes, diminished lead contamination, and increasing housing values. Today, new and existing residents are eager to see commercial investment coming back to the neighborhood in, in such uh, buildings such as the mixed-use corner buildings. They want to see a coffee shop, a dry cleaner, a deli, or even a bookstore. Unfortunately, the current zoning code makes it difficult to bring the much-needed commercial vitality to transitional urban neighborhoods such as, as Oliver. We are currently working on the rezoning of two corner stores in an R7 district, previously zoned commercial in a district, residential district, into a coffee shop and a small neighborhood restaurant. The support for these uses by residents is overwhelming. Due to an outdated zoning code, especially related to transitional neighborhoods, um, especially in urban renewal areas, will take months or even years until they will, we, will label, sorry, we will be able to see the much needed change. It is for this reason that I support the Title IX, particularly the new category, neighborhood commercial establishments as a condition of use, which proposes forward thinking rules and regulations fit to a growing city and changing city, um, in, especially in transitional neighborhoods. Thank you. Do you have a question? Sure. But you're not talking about corner stores when you're talking about the neighborhood commercial. I'm talking about those mixed-use buildings that were beautiful buildings built in the early uh, 1900s, which had small convenience, not convenience store, but small neighborhood commercial serving the neighborhood. Okay, so they were built as houses. The top floors, but the bottom was ah. commercial. And that's why, uh, gotcha. that's how the zoning actually is looking Gotcha, at, right? I understand what's happening. Yes, do you agree with right. that? Right. Well, I think we should zone it commercial. I mean, what, we were told is it's structures like a church or something that was built as a different kind of structure from a house. We we're very familiar with row houses that have long had commercial uses in non-conforming commercial uses. I mean, we're phasing out 105 of them that have liquor licenses as part of this code. So I think that's, that's pretty dramatic. Hmm? That's, that I don't support, that the commercial use becomes... Well, the we're trying to do uses. both, we're going in both directions right. at the same right. time. That's right. So, pardon me, while I, I mean, cope with the one and understand more and more what the other one is, and that's... Um, I have neighborhoods, and this has always been the problem, I have lots of um, neighborhoods, densely occupied, vacant, corner stores, mm -hmm. some of them vacant, and the neighborhood praying to keep them vacant because of all the trouble they cause when they're open. So we're in a quandary here. There's nobody right, there's nobody wrong. But 
the more I hear about neighborhood commercial use, I don't want anybody in Chum at the corner of this and that, for example, or on the X block of Arford going in and opening a commercial use because there's a closed down corner store on the first floor of a three-story house. Yeah, I, I just, uh, because of um, when, when you have a vacant property for so long, basically turns down to residential, in residential areas, right? If it's and vacated have, if it's as vacated. a non-conforming right. use right. for more so, than 18 months. Right, right, so when you're working in very, in highly vacant neighborhoods that you're turning back to life. I hear you. You need to have a minimum of supporting uses to those new families. Well then, why don't we look at the issue of non-conforming uses? and look at how we deal with that and do it through the urban renewal plan. I represented proudly, it represented Oliver for many, many, many years. And I am thrilled to see what's being done. I wish I, you know, I, I wish I'd been part of it, but I got, you know, I'm in a different district. <laughs> so I just go and say, yay. There's a better way to do this than just invent something that would threaten my chum neighborhood mm -hmm. while helping yours, because we're not getting the kind of help there. Same, you know chum, Coldstream Homestead, Montebello, up by City College. I, I completely understand, and I yeah. hope uh, there's a way. I think there's got to be a way to like maybe through urban renewal plans, let you extend that non-conforming use beyond its vacancy period through the urban renewal plan, if you choose, and let us say that that's okay to do in the zoning code, instead of this specter. She doesn't mean a ghost. She means a ghost. She means a ghost. I am just blown away by the percentage of, of vitality that you brought back. But I was just curious, is it home ownership or is it rental? It's, it's a mix. Uh, we have a tremendous demand for good quality rental homes as much as home ownership. Uh, home ownership takes a little longer to, to fill to bring uh, because, because a lot of people, you know, in the last past uh, few years, they have a lot of credit issues. So as uh, things are turning now, are changing, we are bringing a lot more home ownership. We are planning over 30 units of home ownership just in 2014. So, uh, but good families also uh, need good rental homes. When I say good, it's good quality. So I'm rental. not, I never represented Oliver like my colleague, but is it one family or is it multiple family dwellings? No, what, what, we put, we, 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 what we do is we develop every single vacant home. We, not, we don't demolish uh -huh, homes. Uh -huh. You bring and them every back. Every family yeah, has yeah. one home. And, you know, it's, you're renting an entire home or you're buying an entire home that is brand new. It brings that kind of pride that the community needs to turn around. Yeah. And now they're pushing us. When do you bring this? When do you bring that? Right? I mean, it's a good feeling. But we need to be supported by all of you. Very to good. Be able to do it. Very good. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Not yet, Chris. Uh, President Jack here. You talked about the area that I represented. I was a big supporter of TRF yep. um, in their efforts to mm -hmm. get the vacant houses supported, um, the cost reduction, and all that little stuff. But since uh, Carl Stokes is the council person, and I'm the president of Hose City Council, that's my area where I live, um, TRF could have came to us. Oh, we, we no, no, listen. When they did Broadway and Preston, which used to be a grocery store, I live two doors, three doors from that. Yes. They came to us and said, hey, look, we want to have the bottom floor commercial. You know, we want to do a coffee shop or something like that. Um, we would have been really amenable to that. And then when you look at the corner of Preston and Barn, I mean, you know, made it all residential when you could have really come to the council people and we could have sit down and try to on those issues out. So in the future, you can let TRF know that if they want to do things like that, all they have to do is talk to us. So um, th thanks for, for that. Um, the, at the time we were uh, rehabbing uh, the corner of Preston and Bond, it was uh, 2010, the, the market was shot really. 
and we did go to Carl Stokes, and um, the, the truth is that the timing was wrong. Now, all the other corners along Broadway, uh, from Eager to, to uh, Preston, are going to be changed yeah, into zoning. Yeah, and we have discussed yeah. with uh, Carl Stokes, and he's yeah. very supportive of that. Right, because the one on Broadway and Eager where Daisy's Cut Rate used to be, is yes. going to be a little rest, a deli. And we are developing so, along with yeah. so So we are trying to do that. It, there is a problem of timing and when the investment can be done. Okay. The problem is right now, we have a lot of operators that want to be in Oliver. At that time, we couldn't find anybody. And so it's, it's a little hard. It's like, okay, you leave it vacant or you rehab it. What do you do? Um, but I agree with you and I appreciate your offer because it's- Okay, all you gotta do is talk to us. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, uh, Chris Ryer. Can, can you can you tell us what hat you're wearing tonight? Yes. Hello? Yes. I'm wearing the hat as the director of the Southeast Community yes. Development Corporation. There we go. Got it? Oh, um, not CPHA, not Baltimore Planning Department, <laughs> Southeast Community Development Corporation. So that means I'm arguing from an investor and a developer perspective. Um, and I don't need to tell you, particularly Councilman Kraft, about Euclidean zoning and what the first district looks like. It's, it's about the most segregated district in terms of land use as anything. Uh, but I'm here tonight um, to argue for a liberal zoning code. So I'm thinking you're the Texas legislature here. And... Um, I am, to, I am here to argue, which is different from a lot of people up here tonight, to argue for tolerance, diversity, and mixed use in our zoning code. We don't have the types of land uses that we've had in the past, even in this district. And our success in Highland Town has been built on breaking down the land use patterns and the settlement patterns, and we now have a thriving neighborhood that's completely different from the neighborhood that we knew 20 years ago. The people are different, the economy is different, everything in Highland Town is, and is different, and it's because it's become a very mixed type of neighborhood. It's mixed in every type of way, and that cosmopolitan mixture has led to a healthy neighborhood and a healthy economy. So. I'm not that familiar with the uh, revised zoning code, but I do know of some things um, that are specifically in there to promote the mixed use, the row house mixed use district and the industrial mixed use districts. They're all things that are valuable. In our case, one of the tools was an arts and entertainment district. We use that in a very liberal sense. We use arts as a way to bring different types of people together. We're not a station north trying to use artists to fill up vacant buildings. Our neighborhood's full. Uh, anyway, uh, my point is that I'm here to argue for a liberal zoning code that encourages mixed use um, in a uh, evolving Baltimore economy. Thank you. Well, well, Chris, you have a few colleagues who want to ask you something or make a comment. Um, well, I, I welcome you to I welcome you to the work sessions uh, to regards to your arguments. Um, I think Mary Pat Clark, you are you? I no. Mean, I, 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 I was surprised to hear you said you weren't stationed north because you. I thought that your corner of the world has the same benefits and de designation as um, Station North in terms of arts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's something we're very proud of. It's very uh, different. Uh, so, I mean, I know you're not Station North, but you do have one of our arts districts. Yes, of course. And, that's, and that gives you a financial advantage, not you personally, but the neighborhood, well-deserved in terms of promoting the arts and things like that. So, I, I just, because I worked down here in the southeast for four years when that was all sort of evolving. Mm -hmm. What? 
The, the economic benefits of, of an arts district are virtually non-existent. Really? Yeah. Well, you know what? We'll take it. We'll, we'll, we'll take yours. Um, and we'll try to make it work. I, I remember what some of the benefits are, and maybe they're not much to you, but they're a heck of a lot up in the 14th. Well, can we have them in Hamden? In in um, in Highland Town, the Arts District straddles the first and second district, um, and it's not an area of high vacancy. Um, it is a, a, an area of high population. In fact, of population growth. Right. Um, All under the old so zoning code. The uh, Arts District in this part of town is sort of a little fish in the big sea rather than in Station North where it's the big fish in the little sea. Because this is a thriving 10,000 people community and Station North is is mostly artists. Well, not really if you really look. Yeah, right. If you really look, no. Well, right. But if you look at the you know, if you look at the height, yeah. It's mostly the same people that have always been there, but they have a lot of new neighbors, and, and they're working very well together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not knocking state. Uh, okay, I, I just... I'm just saying we're different. I got it. Councilman Career. Thank you. Um, Chris, um, I think the first thing I want to say is that a lot of that growth has happened under the present zoning code, particularly in the residential area. And, you know, the community groups up there have been very insistent upon not breaking up those houses into multifamily houses, you know, the row houses right, up right. there. And that has helped stabilize that area to allow it to develop the diverse neighborhood that it has developed. Um, with regard to the, the community um, commercial districts and the, the corner stores and things like that and, and the experience we've had along East Baltimore Street, sort of Highland Avenue and some of those areas like that. Um, and, and we've had these discussions in Canton also. Um, what the discussion is somebody always wants a neat little coffee shop on the corner. You know, they, they want a coffee shop or, you know, they want um, you know, some other for lack right. of a better word, you know, yuppie right, right. sort of place, right? Um, the thing is, when you zone it, it, there's 92 other things that can be there. And when that person who, you know, th their friend and neighbor who opens the shop and who had this great idea and runs out of money in six months and it's closed, and then the next person comes in and wants to put in a personal services business, which turns out to be a spa, you know, it's not what anybody in the community wanted it to be, right? But when you rezone it, that's what it's open to. So we have to be, you know, really careful about the things because as Laurie said, you know, it's, it's, it's about the, um, it doesn't distinguish between good and bad businesses. It doesn't distinguish between who owns them and who develops them. It gives the land a, a usage or a, a category of usages. And once that land has those category of usages, it has it. And then doesn't matter who owns it, good owner, bad owner, mediocre owner, they can do with it what he or she will. And so that's really the concern. I think I do share your concern from the liberal aspect of it, and I don't know how quite to do it, and I think we can talk about this in the work session, is where you do have areas like we have in Highland Town, like we have in the Broadway corridor, um, where you have a lot of places where there are commercial first floors where we could do serious residential second, third, fourth floors in some of these areas which hasn't been done or it has been done illegally or as, as you know, sort of flop houses. Um, we could do some stuff that's really creative there. The young man that was talking about the North Avenue corridor before, um, you know, I think those types of areas are open for that kind of creative activity. And, um, and I think, you know, we should be looking at that. And when you talk about liberalizing it, it's, it's how do we do that, but do something that, that we can do across the city and I think that brings us full circle to Councilman Henry 
and then the and the, the good use of conditional uses to meet um, you know the, the particular needs of particular neighborhoods Councilman Henry. Thank, thank you mr. chair um, I, yeah I have my own mic thanks um, councilman Walsh left it to me uh, the first thing I wanted to ask is I wanted to uh, ask you to refresh my memory because I had this vague recollection also that the arts and entertainment districts aren't all they're cracked up to be but the part that was especially frustrating that I remembered from working in Patterson Park was that there were economic benefits to the artists to the residents that the district would attract what there weren't were any financial incentives to the developer to develop the units for the artists to use. Yeah. Um, so there, there are three benefits. One is um, the entertainment tax is abated, um, so that does a lot for the Charles Theater and the Everman Theater. Um, the old Everyman Theater. It's not Everyman anymore. Uh, the new one on Fayette. Are they in the same arts? They're in the new arts the new district. Oh, That's the new one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was still thinking of Station North. I'm sorry. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, the second one is a Maryland income tax right. abatement, which is a state thing. The, the city one is a um, a um, a forgiveness. A, a, it's an abatement of the city property tax. It's it's like an enterprise zone. It's frozen for a certain period of time um, at a lower level, um, but it's only it only applies to the part of the building used for arts related uses. Right. So in Station North, we have a lot of vacant industrial space that can be valuable if the developer is putting a lot of money into the building and if his tenants are putting a lot of money into their rent, which neither is the usual case. Right. Just like the Maryland income tax, artists don't generally make a lot of money, nor are they, they're often accused of not declaring what they do make. So um, that, that has not been a very useful to yeah, okay. they, 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 yeah. uh, arts district is mostly a marketing tool. Starving hard. Starving hard. Starving hard. The, the, right. the, the other the thing. Artistry of taxes, right? The, the other thing I wanted to do is I just wanted to thank you for using the word liberal so many times in your testimony, <laughs> as if it's a good thing, which is not We're something still that Baltimore. not not something you hear a lot at the Texas Legislature. Right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chris. Um, okay, that's everyone who signed up. Is there anyone else who would like to testify that had, did not sign up? All right, then I'm going to um, hear from Councilwoman Clark at this point um, so that she can uh, perform her regular ritual. Um, let me explain that the reason I do this at every meeting is that um, I'm submitting amendments and comments on the, on the uh, chapters, the titles that are being heard on a given night. We have 19 titles, and um, for example, tonight we're hearing title nine, the row house and multifamily title. So I'm writing my amendments and comments based on, primarily on that. And have done that since the first title. Um, and th that's why I know I read every word. Um, not that it was always thrilling. So, in Title, title IX, Row House and Multifamily Residential Districts, um, I've submitted to the file um, amendments that expand the categories of existing single family houses which cannot be converted to multifamily. It is proposed in by planning that no conversions are allowed in R5 and R6. Um, I'm expanding that to uh, R7 and R8 districts, uh, proposing. And uh, I'm amending various um, uses. Um, every category, row houses have various permitted uses and conditional uses. And so I'm amending, and copies of this are available if people want to see the details and um, uh, where uh, what's permitted 
conditional and conditional by ordinance for dwellings, multifamily, for fraternities and sorority houses, uh, for educational facility, primary and secondary, for hospital, places of worship. See, I told you. Um, uh, bed and breakfast, one of my favorites. I'm deleting um, conditional um, with the board and leaving that blank so that there's no way to have beds and breakfasts in R5 through R10. You can have them in the larger houses that are in R1A through R4. Delete in its entirety the category called neighborhood commercial establishments in R5 through R10 and delete and leave blank. Um, delete the definition that's found in Title I. Um, also changing the um, permitted and conditional uses for open space in, the, in these areas for alternative energy systems, parking structures as a principal use in wireless telecommunication antennas. I'd like to take a moment to talk about fraternities and sororities and amendments that I'm putting in. There, there really are two kinds of fraternities and sororities um, that are land uses, and we really need to separate them. The one is the residential kind where uh, undergraduates live in a group home. It's residential. They might have a common dining room. The other is adults, postgraduate, who have male and female, well, the fraternities and sororities that are part of their lives as adults and in which they are um, quite different from the residential ones with kids. So I separated them and what I did was propose that sorority fraternity houses, that term be used for the kids. Um, that it say fraternity sorority house means primarily residential structure, including a common uh, dining room, for members of a fraternal or sororal organization or association for the housing of undergraduates of local colleges and universities. And then I took out the implication that the adult fraternities and adult sororities are part of a generic definition. And I put them under, um, um, an existing category which is called lo lo Lodge and Social Clubs. And then um, amended the definition of Lodge or Social Club to include non-residential fraternities and sororities. So it would be uh, a Lodge or Social Club includes one, a union hall that's already there, and a non-residential postgraduate fraternity and, sor and sorority center. Um, and then that would, and then I'm amending, uh, zoning um, already, there's already perfectly suitable categories for lodges and social, um, I'm sorry, social, I always forget, social clubs and, and adult fraternities and sororities. Um, but I am amending the tables, the use tables, for the remaining fraternity sorority house, the kids. That it's neither permitted or conditional in C1, C1 VC, R7, and R8, and it's conditional with zoning board approval in C1 E and C2, and condition, conditional by city ordinance in R9 and R10. So in other words, it, 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 it's thorough and probably hopeless, but I'm gonna try. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee and everybody. I just need to say, I have to say this out loud to meet the obligations of letting it be known at a public hearing what I'm proposing and when I, what's gonna happen in work sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, I just want to say that um, 
get ready to recess. The next full hearing on City Council Bill 12-0152, Transform Baltimore Zoning, will be held on Monday, Monday, October 28th at 6.30 p.m. at the Benjamin Franklin at Mason Cove High School, which is loaded, located at 1201 Cambria Street, Baltimore, Maryland, 21225, which is in the Brooklyn neighborhood. And this will be Title 11, Industrial Districts. Districts will be the topic during this hearing. I want to thank everyone for attending tonight's hearing for land use and transportation. And please check around you to make sure you leave and take whatever belongings you brought. So again, thank everyone for attending tonight. And be safe. Bye.